Hi, I'm Vince Weaver, an associate professor at the University of Maine, and I'm here today to talk to you about size coding on the Apple II. Uh, as an aside, I have a side project where I took the same program and size optimized it for 30 different architectures a while back. I need to get back to it and re-optimize 6502 code. You can check that out. But today I'll be talking about uh, specifically the Apple II architecture. So, the Apple II. Uh, it was first released in 1977, one of the original 1977 Trinity. Uh, the Commodore PET people like to say they were first, and while it's true, they were the first ones you could pre-order. The first you actually could buy was an Apple II. It has a 1 megahertz 6502 processor in it from 4 to 48K of RAM, a discrete uh, 7400 series logic in it. Uh, you load the stuff off a cassette tape, a bitbang speaker, a 40 by 24 text mode, a 40 by 40 at 15 color low res mode, a 140 by 192 six color high res graphics. Uh, you did need to have at least 16K in your system for graphics, and it had Waz's, internet, Waz's integer basic in ROM. The Apple II Plus came out in 1979, an update. Uh, mostly it had 48K RAM standard, and by then most people had 140K, 5 and a quarter inch floppies, and the basic was replaced with AppleSoft, Microsoft basic in ROM. Apple IIe came out a bit later. Uh, by now, 64K RAM was standard, you got to, up to 128K. It finally had lowercase letters. Uh, 80 column card was standard. Uh, if you had 128K, you can get some fancier graphics modes. Apple II Enhanced came out a little bit late after that. It had a 6.5 CO2 processor in there now, which uh, had some more advanced, more compact opcodes you could use. But if you used those, you weren't backwards compatible with the older systems. Uh, 128K of RAM and had mouse text, which was uh, you know, extra characters, text characters for drawing text GUI-like uh, applications, sort of Mac-like applications. They weren't very useful for ASCII art. Apple IIc came out, 6502 is a sort of portable system. It was mostly compatible, backwards compatible. You could also get a 2C plus with a built-in accelerator to run it faster. And finally, the last Apple II is the Apple II GS. Uh, this is actually a 16-bit system with a 65C816, which is actually the same chip that was in the Super Nintendo. Much more advanced, much better graphics, much better sound, uh, including a sound chip by the guy who, who did the Commodore 64 SID chip. This is a whole other story, whole other optimization task, so I won't be going covering this in this talk. So the first thing with Apple II optimization is, of course, optimizing for the 6502 processor. And there's some typical trips, tricks for that. Uh, some simple ones are counting your loops backwards, usually saves a byte. The bit trick where you can skip over uh, things by putting them inside the bit instruction, putting your data and code in the zero page, using the X and Y registers whenever possible, self-modifying code. And when all else fails, you can give a mask Cucumba, who is the famous Apple II 6502 size optimizer who can usually shave a byte or two off pretty much any program that you can send him. Over there with me is Chuck Peddle, uh, the lead designer of the 6502 chip. He's actually an alumnus of the University of Maine, and we actually got him to come visit a few years back. So Apple II specific optimizations. So like most 6502 systems, zero page is at page zero, the stack's at page one, you have some free space, and then a low res graphics has a, two pages you can view. One at starting at 4, one starting at 8. Some more free space and the high res pages are starting at page 20 to page 40 and page 40 to page 60. We got some more free room and then DOS, so the operating system was a little higher. Starting at C0, that's where the uh, I.O. and the soft switches and the card, expansion card ROMs go. And after that, starting at D0, you have the AppleSoft ROM, the basic ROM, and then at the end you have the monitor ROM. And you can use some of those routines there to write some compact code. So as we view the text in low res, they live in the same spot, uh, one kilobyte starting at address hex 400. Uh, in 6502, you use the dollar sign to mean hex decimal. So it's a low res 40 by 48, 15 color mode with, uh, you would say, why not 16? Well, the two grays are identical, or at least they're, it's complicated, but you can view them as identical. And optionally, you can flip into the bottom four lines of the screen, four lines of text for the bottom of the screen. You can turn that on or off. The text mode is 40 by 24, no color. Uh, it's, you can get normal text, flashing text, or inverted text. On uh, the 2 and 2 plus, you only get lowercase. There's no box or line characters, no custom characters. You're noticing nothing fancy here. There's no sprites, there's no palette rotations, anything like this. It's very simple. And the memory layout, you might think, well, isn't a fast way to access things, just to start at the beginning and just write you know, linearly. But it's due to Steve Wozniak's design, it's not like that. There's actually a three-way interleave, where the first line starts at 400, goes to 427, which is uh, 40 bytes in, like you'd expect but then it jumps way ahead. And you notice that uh, if you kept going on that line, you'd end up at line eight, and then again in line 16. And uh, so it makes it a bit hard to program. 
Uh, and additionally, you'll notice that you know, for a 40 by, I mean, a 40 by 24 screen, there's actually some bytes left over to make a full 1K. You think you can access it all. But because the original system's only in 4K, they stuck some uh, scratch RAM for some of the peripherals down there. So the things called memory holes you have to avoid. In text mode, you just go the line you want, and you write the ASCII byte. But of course, you have to set the, if you want it to be plain ASCII text, you have to set the height bit. So, you know, or if, uh, hex 80. Uh, and also the flashing or inverse, it depends on bit seven and six, which gets a little complicated. Uh, low res mode, it's sort of the same as text, it's just instead of writing ASCII byte, you write the top and low nibbles of the byte will give you the colors you want. And down here you can see this 15 colors you can do this to. Uh, to actually activate the graphics mode, there's a concept of soft switches. These are memory addresses you read. Sometimes write the later models, you sometimes write them instead to set a clear machine state. Usually did this with bit instruction or LDA or SDA, you know, you can, any way you access it. Again, there's some complications, but they're, they're not super important for what we're doing here. So you have one thing, enable graphics mode or text mode, full screen or having the four lines of text, uh, displaying page one or page two so you can flip pages. Uh, when displaying graphics, or you can enable the low-res or the high-res graphics modes. And so to enable low-res manually, you might do this series of instructions, that's 12 bytes, where you have to set those various bits by, I mean, accessing the very memory locations. Uh, instead, you just call in the ROM. Apple II has some well-defined stable entry points. Uh, they're described in the manual, also some of the things that are used by AppleSoft. In theory, depending if you're using clone system or otherwise, they could change, but you know it's been long enough passed by now that you can pretty much be sure that you know the common ones you can still you know jump to for example there's a set graphics call that puts the low res mode the same as the applesoft gr command and it'll set the lowest graphics mode set you to page one split the text and graphics and clear to black so if that's what you want you know this can save a whole bunch of you know independent instructions now the fast point the to plot points fast can be sort of difficult because we said we had that weird interleave. The fast way to do this is usually have a lookup table, and then what you do is you load the Y coordinate, uh, you mask off the bottom bit to make it even, and then you look it up in the offset table, and then you store it to a page in the low page as you use an index byte. You load the color, and again, for this, you want the top and bottom um, nibbles the same, you can plot the color. The problem is, if you're trying to do 40 by 48 graphics, uh, when you're plotting a point, the top or bottom nibbles, you actually have to load in the old value mask off the value or them in because you only want to set the top or the bottom. Sometimes to make things smaller, you can just do what sort of more of like a 4 by 40 by 24 mode, where in that case, you just have the top and bottom nibbles the same, and it's a lot faster, but you know, the resolution's a little bit less. So it's a very fast way to access memory. Uh, you know, index against off the zero page like that. The problem is, you know, you have like 48 bytes here off the top, and if you're trying to size code, you know, this is not going to fit. Instead, you can use a ROM routine. So there's a ROM routine for plotting points. So to plot, for example, to plot a light green point at 1010 on the screen, you just load CC, which is the light green color. Uh, you store it to a zero page address, uh, in 30 zero page address. You load the uh, X and Y coordinates into the Y and A registers and just jump the plot. And it does, and then it just plots on the screen. It's small. Unfortunately, it does slow because it does a lot of math to calculate the address. Uh, you can do a compromise here. If you're drawing in the same line, there's no need to recalculate the line address each time because it's going to be the same. So you can call the gbase calc uh, command, which will set up in the zero page the pointer for you. Uh, calling plot once will also do this. And now you have to make sure the mask in zero page 2e is right to zero f ref zero. But if you do that, if you call plot one, it'll plot a point at the current y coordinate with the x coordinate in the y register. And if you do that, if you're drawing like a whole line across, it can be, you know, decently fast, but uh, still reasonably compact. Um, there's some other calls you can use that are useful in the ROM for making compact code. HLINE will draw a horizontal line from register Y to the value in zero page 2C on line A. There's a V line, same for drawing a vertical line. Uh, the screen command will get the color of a pixel if you want that for some reason. And set call will set the color to 8 times 17, and that sounds a weird thing to multiply it, but we said the top and bottom nibbles are the same, and you can do the math by multiplying by 17 of a uh, 4-bit value. We'll actually duplicate it top and bottom. So where do we find these ROM routines? Well, the Apple manuals from the old days are actually really good if you can find them online. Also, people have posted ROM disassemblies online for AppleSoft and both that and the Monitor ROM, and those are very useful to look for and look for routines that could be useful to you. And you can set, use some of these in a usual fashion. So for example, here's the 64-byte Doom Flame demo I did. It was 80 bytes. I couldn't really get smaller. But if you notice it, it's moving. It's scrolling up, just everything up by one line. And the graphics doesn't support scrolling. 
But in the ROM, there is a routine for when you type text and hit enter off the edge of the screen, it scrolls it up. So what this is actually doing, it's using the text ROM scrolling routine. And since the text and low res graphics are the same on the Apple II, you can use this routine. It adds a little bit of flicker, but it saves 16 bytes over trying to do things manually. One more thing you can do is page flipping. If you want smooth animations, you can draw a screen and then flip pages. Uh, unfortunately, the ROM routines for low-res aren't page-aware, so you can't. You have to manually add things. And in general, it takes about 20 bytes to do this. So you know, maybe not be something you want to do in maybe a 64-byte entry. So high-resolution graphics, they're actually even worse than low-resolution, if you can imagine that. Uh, in addition to the three-way interleaving, uh, each line is has an eight-way interleaving going now, then, where every eighth line, it comes back. But you know, you start at 2,000 in hex, then skip a K, skip a K to the end, and then you bump up a bit again. And again, there's memory holes, though in these cases you can overwrite them, unlike low res. But it's really complicated to find the address. Uh, the graphics mode is 280 by 192 on a mono monitor. It's drawing, you know, vertical, I mean, it's drawing uh, points at, at, at that spacing. If you view this on an NTSC color monitor, you get NTSC artifacts, which cause it to form color in roughly 140 by 192. And the way it's even drawn is really complicated. For each two bytes, you get seven color pixels. So each byte is roughly three and a half color pixels. And when you draw the pixels, uh, you know, two, two, uh, the two multiples of two bits, zero, zero is black, zero, one is color one, one, zero is color two, and one is white. Uh, one interesting aspect of this is adjacent zero, zeros or one, ones are always black or white, even if they aren't aligned. So you can sometimes, when you're changing colors, get a black or white fringing between the lines. And, um, Additionally, you might say, uh, you know, if a byte or two bytes mapping to 14 pixels, uh, black and white pixels, you know, what about the extra uh, two bits in the byte? The original Apple II, they were uh, ignored, but then Waz quickly found out you can use these to set a half bit shift in the output and can change your colors. And so you get the two high-res palettes this way, the green and purple, black and white palette, and the orange and blue, black and white palette. You can change this by setting the high bit in the byte so every three and a half pixels, you can change the palette. And, uh, but this does mean that you have trouble when you're switching colors or trying to have you know, the two palettes mix and you end up with a color clash, a lot like you get, say, on a, a ZX80 Spectrum type machine. And uh, there, so because it's so hard to do direct drawing to the screen, often you use the ROM high-res routines for this. Uh, there's some useful ones, HGUR and HGUR2. These are the same as the commands you get in AppleSoft Basics. Uh, HGUR will set the high-res mode, set it to mixed text and uh, graphics using page one and clear to zero. HGUR2 will set high res, it'll put it in full screen mode, uh, showing page two and clear to zero. Uh, there's an hclear command that will clear the page, either 20 or 40, that's in zero page E6, uh, it's black, or the background command, which will, which will clear it to the last color plotted. There's an h position command that'll move to the x coordinate yx and y coordinate a. It takes two bytes to specify the x coordinate because you know, it's 280 wide, so it won't fit in one byte. There's an h plot zero that'll plot the point at y, x, a. And there's a draw line to command and a draw line level to, to command you can draw with. And some useful zero page addresses. There's the um, E6 holds the current draw page. Uh, 2627, that's where the current line address stores. So you can do a thing like with low res where you set the line and once you're in there, you can index into it a little bit faster. And E4 stores the color pattern. And again, this is uh, not zero through seven, like you might think for picking which color, but it's actually the bit pattern. And so there's a lookup table in ROM you can use to get that. One other thing the Apple II has, it has shape tables in ROM. This is in ROM vector drawing. So you can draw these vectors. You can rotate them, scale them. It also does collision detection when drawing them. And so you can draw or X draw, or draw just draws it, and X draw does an exclusive or. So if you draw it twice, it'll you know, uh, remove it. So that's handy for animation. And um, you put the shape table you want, uh, you put a pointer to it in 1A, 1B in the zero page. The scale goes in E7, and when you call the calls, the uh, rotation's in A. And the format itself is a bit too much to go into here, but you can either draw and move up, down, left, and right, or don't draw, but still move. And so you can draw these out, and you can pack up to two or three of these per byte. It's complicated based on the things. But you know, down below, you can see some examples where we're drawing some shapes and scaling them or rotating them. And it can help you draw some high-res graphics fairly compactly. You can also use the high-res routines in unusual ways. Uh, down below here, you see a low-res graphics routine, but it's actually using an off-screen uh, texture for doing the drawing. And the way it does this is we use HGUR or HGUR2 to initialize the screen, then drop the low-res if a single three-byte instruction drop the low-res mode. And we can also use the high-res background 
uh, call. It'll clear or set the high-res memory at you know, 4,000 or 6,000, but uh, it's a lot faster than hand-coding a memory clear routine. And you can also clear it to a bit pattern, and so we use that to initialize the RAM here a lot sm faster and smaller than we could have if we had to open code a routine. Some other useful things inside coding, random numbers. The Applesoft ROM routine has a floating point random number generator. It's not very useful at all. It's also not very random. You can make a relatively compact 8-bit uh, linear feedback uh, pseudo random number generator in 652 assembly around 13 bytes. Uh, often what people do if they need really small random number, roughly random numbers, is just index into the ROM. And it's sort of random enough uh, you know, for star fields and stuff like that. It's more or less good enough. Other things, math, you might say, can we get nice ROM routines for sine, cosine, square root, and all that. And Applesoft has those, but again, they're complex to use. They're not really that fast, and they're hard to use compactly. So usually you have to waste some space with lookup tables. Uh, reading the keyboard, uh, the way you do this, you read the value at address C C1000 in the uh, I.O. space. If it's positive, it means there's no key press, but it's negative. The bottom seven bits of the ASCII, and you can test this easily, the branch plus, branch minus 6502. Once you've read it, you need to clear the keyboard strobe. We're reading CO10 which will uh, clear things, set up with an access. It's ASCII only, so no raw mode, which means only key down events, no key ups. You can't actually get things like the controls and things like that are being pressed uh, independently. Uh, and the older manual machines, you had to manually hold down a repeat key to get a repeat when you hold something down, but there was auto repeat. This makes writing games really a pain. Um, so sound, there's a plain speaker at CO30. Uh, there's no timer or hardware support for this. The only way you get it, you access it and it clicks. And if you have anything more than clicks or like a groaning noise, you have to cycle count, which makes it hard to do compactly. Uh, a common expansion or a relatively common expansion is a Mockingboard chip, which had AY38910 chips for it uh, behind a 6522 I.O. device. So you can, it uh, has in timers for it, and you can, you know, do chip tune type music. It's really hard to side code, size code this, though. In general, it takes, you know, hundreds of instructions. So it's, it's, it can be hard to get nice music in compactly in, on the Apple II. One thing I mentioned is the Applesoft Basic Twitter bot. On Twitter, you can upload 280 characters of Basic into this, and it will actually run them in an emulator and post the results, and it's a lot of fun. And the interesting thing is, we've been working on this, but we can get up to 144 bytes of machine language into the Basic payload. And so it's caused a whole bunch of new size coding ideas where we try to optimize things. And you know, it's a different range. It's not 128 or 256, but 144. And on Apple II, it's actually a nice sweet spot for getting interesting demos, so you can check that out. So now some issues you might have when trying to make your size coding product for a competition. So uh, get, getting your execute on disk image, uh, if you want it to auto run, uh, in basic, Applesoft basic, you use the hello basic command by tradition is the one that gets run. And so if you put this print chr screen for vrun file name, the place of your file name inside of your, uh, inside of that program and have it saved on disk, it'll automatically run. So you can automatically run your machine code program uh, when it runs. Uh, header size, this is important size coding. Apple II uh, binary files have a four bytes of header. It's a 16-bit little Indian address that it gets loaded at, and a 16-bit little Indian address is the file size. And uh, these are not loaded into memory, so you know, m most competitions will let you not use these, at least for smaller sizes, because you know, they're not useful. There's no way they're useful. They're just on disk. In fact, these probably should have been in the file system metadata, but the people designing the file system, you know, it's a very early file system. They you know, didn't really know what they were doing. Uh, we're trying to Dawson basic, larger demos. Uh, people often want you to be, ha, check for key press and then return back to the prompt. This is tricky on the Apple II. Most people didn't ever worry about this. You just reboot the machine. If you need to return back to DOS or the basic, try not to stomp on the DOS part of the zero page. And again, that's all scattered around, so it's tricky to do. Try not to stomp on the IRQ vectors that live around 3D0 to 3FF. Try to avoid memory above 9600. That's a little bit easier to do. And then just hope for the best and jump to 3DO, which is where the return to DOS vector lives. Boot sector demos, you want to try that. You know, uh, Apple II had 140K disk. Uh, the DOS 3.3 file system, which eventually became the standard, has 35 tracks of 16 sectors, each 256 bytes each. When you boot up the system, on, uh, after the, starting with the Apple II Plus, it had the, this in ROM. It would read track 0, sector 0, would be read by the disk firmware by default. And this can be pretty fast. The disk 2 is much faster than loading from cassette, and it's a lot faster also than the Commodore 64. So it's not as slow, and with the right routines, you can actually get much faster. Anyway, the first uh, 256 bytes is loaded into memory and address 800, and then it gets jumped to 801. You might say, what gets loaded at 800? 800 in your file is usually one. It, it tells the firmware how many sectors to load. Most people leave that at one. One additional thing you probably want to do with your demo is to turn off the drive motor. 
Uh, otherwise, the drive mode will just keep running unless you turn it off. So you have to waste three bytes doing this where you load A from a certain address and you have to know which slot the disk drives in, which again, you can find out and it takes a few extra bytes to find that out. It's usually slot six on an Apple II. Some people ask about double low res and some of the other advanced graphics modes for the Apple IIe. So you can get an 80 by 40, 15 color mode. It's complicated to program, the ROM routines will help much. There's lots of soft switches and bank switch memory you have to set. Uh, the horizontal bytes alternate between main and auxiliary memory every other byte, which is a pain to program, and page flipping is difficult. Still, people use it for some things and can use it for demos. Not very compactly, though. About those soft switches, so the Apple IIe, you can switch between uh, regular memory in 64K and auxiliary memory in 64K. The problem is when you switch, everything switches, including the zero page, the stack. Uh, you need to have code in the exact same location because suddenly your instruction pointer your program counter is in the other auxiliary memory. To make things a little bit easier, if just doing graphics, they have a mode you can set where page one and page two, now instead of switching between the two pages in memory for graphics access, they switch between auxiliary and main memory. And so that way, you can very easily program the graphics by just switching the page flipping. So instead of switching, switching the pages, it switches between uh, the two things you need to do. Some of these more advanced auxiliary switch bank switching stuff, you need to write instead of read or write to set soft switches. And some of the more complicated ones for the language card, you actually need to do double reads or double writes and even more complicated things like that. Some useful ones though, 80 store on is the one that switches to the page switching to main auxiliary video. 80 column on, you need to have 80 column card enabled to do these modes. Uh, all care select on, that's if you want to do the mouse text. And Enunciator 3 got repurposed to enable the double graphics modes. Double high res another mode, it's 140 by 192, like in high res, but with 15 colors. That's even more complicated the program. And again, page flipping is difficult. Um, colors are four bits, and there's no palette, so you think that'd be easier, just four bits. But it turns out that it, the palette bit still there is ignored, so you have to fit these four bits in seven bits, so they get, they get offset and make it even more confusing. The colors are shifted, and between auxiliary and memory, every byte gets between them, and it's just a nightmare to program. Uh, you can still do it, though, and people have done interesting things with double high res. Finally, some people are interested in my coding setup. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it to anyone, just what I'm comfortable using. Uh, I use Linux with the nano editor. You know, it's low end, but it works for me. Then I use the CA65 assembler from CC65 project. If I make file that makes the things, and it uses a custom tool I have called DOS33FS that will copy my programs to the disk images. And then I tested disk images in the Apple Win emulator, which I run under Wine on Linux. So it's a tower of different things in a way here. And finally, once I've tested it, I want to try it in real hardware. I have uh, you know, USB or SD card uh, disk emulators on my various Apple IIs. And so I just copy the files over that way. And that's how I get them working and test it. So that's all for my presentations. Any questions, feel free to email me. Uh, you can find more info on this and links on my website here. Thanks.